<laughs> All right, everyone. I'm going to uh, get to the last panel of the day, which is all about advocacy and inspiration. Um, our thought in planning the day was that you would hear about the many issues and problems in the states and the complexities, and then you would be inspired to take action um, in some way when you get back home. So I am moderating this panel on advocacy and inspiration. I'm, uh, I think you know, Emily Hiltrin, Double A Director of Government Relations. Yay! And to my left is Chris Kasnovich, who is at Stanford Libraries and is also a founding member of Free State Government Information. She'll be talking a little bit about that awesome group. And then to her left, yes, absolutely. Um, to her left is Seamus Kraft, who is the founding executive director, co-founder, right? executive, co -founder director. executive director of the Open Gov Foundation. Um, what? No applause? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, we're going to be talking, and I think it's going to be a pretty open and, and inviting conversation. We really want to hear a bit from you all too about what you're thinking about, but. We'll be talking a bit about some of the different projects, um, some of which you may have heard about, some of which you may not have, um, and really inspiring you, like I said, to, to go back home and, and do something um, on this issue. And, and AAAL's interest um, in copyright, copyrighted state legal materials and, and federal materials um, is pretty entrenched in, in our public policy program. Our government relations policy includes um, pretty explicit language on this. It says, uh, we support a general prohibition against copyright restrictions on government works, including copyright claims, restrictive licenses, royalty arrangements, statutory or regulatory provisions, interpretations of federal, state, or local laws and regs that restrict access to or the use of, reuse of, or the reuse of government information. Um, and although the Uniform Electronic Legal Material Act does not include, uh, it's pretty explicit that it excludes copyright or doesn't deal with copyright issues in UELMA, um, we have been involved in various efforts at the state level. And one of the projects that our Digital Access to Legal Information Committee helps support is a state online legal information website which is a website on our uh, homepage, all net, on our website, that includes information for each state and DC on preservation, authentication, permanent public access, and copyright um, and citation status of primary legal materials. Um, and that website was originally built off of the National Inventory of Legal Materials, um, that AAAL worked with the Law Library of Congress and Carl Malamud on um, starting six, seven years ago um, and is now being maintained, like I said, by, by hundreds of volunteers um, and our AAAL Digital Access to Legal Information Committee. So that's one of the things that AAAL is doing. Um, but I really want to open it up to what you guys are doing. And so my first question um, is to kind of bring it all together this day. Um, so if you could talk about what are the problems you see with the current environment um, around state accessibility, state copyright, um, and if you could talk a little bit about the work that you and your organizations have been doing to promote the public domain and advocate against copyright restrictions. So simple question, if you could answer <laughs> one to two sentences. <laughs> um, no, but either one it's of you an absurd disaster. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be fixed, and if you can help in some way, since you, so uh, disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, I don't have a legal background, it is fantastic to be speaking to a group of people who actually have um, that background, because as I found in doing this work, I started off, I'm a GovDocs librarian, um, and I've been working with state and local GovInfo for quite some time, um, and I have constantly bumped up against this what we, can, what we would call this ambiguous nature of copyright with state government <laughs> publications. And how are we going to scan and digitize them and make them available to people to go do whatever they want to do out there? Um, and so that's how I kind of got started in all of this. And 
What I found um, with getting our group together, Free State Gov Info, was that um, it was originally another librarian, a state uh, librarian from Michigan, and someone who works at Hockey Trust. Um, we needed a lawyer in, in the mix, because without having someone with that background, first of all, no one wants to talk to you know me, I'm like a docs librarian, they're like, oh, and you don't have a law background, you don't know the law, I mean, I can cite the law, I can bring it, but I don't have kind of the necessary tool set to have effective communications um, on that level, nor do I have ne the necessary skill sets. Um, I can do it, but I'm not great at it, to do the legal research behind what are the copyright issues, the copyright laws um, in the different states to be able to come forth and really build a case and say, this is a mess, it needs to be fixed, and here's how we do it. Um, and that was when I met uh, Kyle Courtney, um, who had actually done the work that our small group was trying to figure out how would we get enough people interested um, and involved to take on this project because we knew at the baseline we needed to have kind of all the data across all the 50 states to say here's the problem how do we deal with it um, and so we were grappling with how are we going to do this kind of 50 state research on copyright issues not just for the legal stuff um, and I have to say hearing what's going on with the, the law um, Sometimes it's kind of giving me pause because I'm like I'm talking about everything, you know, the the executive agencies, the judicial reports, the legislature, the bills. You all are talking about a law that's been passed. We're looking at bills that never passed. We're looking at the legislative journals. We're looking at the hearings. We're talking about everything, soup to nuts. It should be my stances in the public domain. It's kind of a no-brainer, so why don't we do it? Um, but that's where we were struggling with, is to try and get the kind of legal, at least the, the baseline information on that. Um, and I think it was at ALA, we got introduced to Kyle Courtney, who said, oh, hey, by the way, I had this uh, intern, <laughs> and we decided to do this massive project. So it actually bolstered us and bumped our Free State Gov Info group about, I would say at least five years ahead because we were looking at, okay, I'm going to do this uh, in my free time. I'm going to go out there on the weekends. I'm going to go bug my law librarians at Stanford and say, gee, can you help me with this project? Because it really is an issue. And why is it an issue? Um, we do, we've done many presentations. So part of our group is just to get out there and get the word out to people who maybe are not in the legal profession but are, are in libraries or maybe dealing with this information and have the ability and the capacity to work with the lawmakers to bring about change. I have faculty in political science departments and economics who they just want to get the state banking reports or they want to get all the legislative rules from all 50 states legislatures, both houses, from the very beginning to the current, and they've scraped all the current stuff off the websites, but it's all that historic stuff. They just want to get it because they're doing some analysis on a very specific gatekeeping rule in the, in the laws, uh, in the rules, for example. So, hey, Hoppy Trust has got some of it. I downloaded it, but it's not all available. And hey, can't you just scan all that for me? And then I'm going to publish all of that stuff with my paper. Wouldn't that be awesome and great? Wouldn't people love that? And guess what? This is my own original research. I'm bringing about a new data set. I'm putting it out there. All kinds of great stuff. Fantastic. We totally want to support it. They talk to me and I say, ah, yeah, there's this copyright thing. It's a problem. And I have had conversations. I used to work at UCLA. I'm up at Stanford. Bar none, 50 state research like this is not going to go away. It is increasing more and more. We want to be able to provide access to this stuff. Not just access, but to open it up so people can do things to that content. And also, if they're going to publish, you know, we try to get our faculty and our students to think about if you're doing a study and you have a data set, and data can be text, it can be images, it can be whatever, that you publish your data along with your publication, your article, your report, whatever it may be. And so these are the things that really bind our hands in trying to support this type of research framework. The other issue is, as a government information librarian, I'm wearing my documents to the people pin. Kind of at the core of the work we do as GovInfo librarians is we feel people have 
the right to have access to this stuff. It's a, again, it's a no brainer. They should be able to download it. They should be able to scan it. If they want to put it in some kind of um, database, that's great. Text mine it. Um, libraries really should be helping to support the digitization efforts of all this historical material to open it up. Let's face it, we need to have kind of that look back into the 60s, into the 70s, um, into the 80s and the 90s, and I would say all the way back to where copyright, is it 22, um, kind of ties our hands in terms of public domain. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, and that's why I finally started finding a few people out there who are of like minds and were like, this is really a pain in the ass. And the fact that I have to go and call how many state agencies, and we have a permission form that we can email them. I have to track all those responses. Half the time I get someone that says, oh, um, <clears throat> we don't have authority. Um, to sign this or to, to respond to this email, let me pass you on to someone else three months later. We ping them back. Oh, don't know yet. So we've had, many of our researchers have had to just ditch certain states because we just can't get any kind of response back from them. So um, it's, it is a problem. And it's, to me, it's extremely troubling when I see just with the law with what's been passed, with what should be, again, we shouldn't, I feel like we shouldn't even be having these conversations, but we are and we have to, and we have to go through this. But while you're having these conversations about the legal materials, can we please be thinking about ways to incorporate non-legal materials, right? If we're going to work on getting those laws changed, let's not ax out everything else. Let's figure out a way to include it. So that's kind of the work that we're doing. We're trying to get people who are interested in this, who are willing to do this, who have legal backgrounds to help with formulating um, model legislation, perhaps. Um, interested in saying, hey, is there something at the federal level that could take place? We could do a federal level change involved in this. And so, again, I want to emphasize we are a very small group. We're very grassroots. Some of the work I've done has just been on a couple bills in the state of California where I was just calling up the staffers and I was sending out letters to our library listers and saying, please, this is important. You've got to you know, write your legislature, call in, tell them that the text of this law is problematic because it's going to take, it's going to give agencies the ability to copyright every little stinking thing that they publish. And this all had to do with the Yosemite debacle, if anyone followed that issue. Um, so it's, it's really just a couple of us, but we would love to expand it. We're trying to, um, I think in the coming year, we'll be working on some model language for legislation. Um, in fact, I just emailed in, and I should also thank the rest of the folks who are um, involved in this. So we've got Christina Eden, who's at Hockey Trust, um, and we have Bernadette Bartlett, who's at um, the Michigan State Libraries. And then we also have a kind of a silent partner, but he was our first kind of legal um, lawyer person to come in. And that's Justin Bonfiglio, who's also at Hathi Trust. And you may have noticed I've mentioned Hathi Trust over and over. Um, <laughs> that's because um, researchers, not just faculty, but people out there are finding the digital materials, the digital state documents because of Google scanning projects. They're finding them in Hathi Trust. Awesome, that's great. That's helping to increase awareness, access to it. But what they then get to is that limited preview. And then they say, oh, oops, it's a tech glitch. Uh, why isn't that available? So I've had many faculty come to me and say, hey, can you call Happy Trust up and ask them to, to fix those links for me so I can <laughs> you know, get in there and download all the rest of those publications? And I'm like, um, I actually know the people to contact, however, it's not a tech glitch, it's a copyright issue. Um, and so working with Hathi Trust, they actually have a mechanism. Uh -huh. What is Hathi Trust? Oh, oh, good. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. Actually, can you just Google Hathi Trust? <laughs> so Hathi Trust is H-A-T-I. T-H-I. Trust. There you go. Oh, Excellent question. Yeah, if I kind of oh, ramble oh, on about some things. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is basically, we 
There's I believe a, it's a partnership uh, of major research institutions. Yeah. <laughs> this is where we're kind of archi archiving, not preserving. preserving. Um, the, the content that got scanned through a lot of these Google book projects. And it's a way to bring all of those collections that have been scanned so you don't have to go to every single library that has uh, been a participant in um, the, the Google Books projects. Um, and what they have up here is you can search so you can find federal government documents, which because of Section 105 are open. If you find that they're limited preview, you can send them a feedback and they'll open it. For state level materials and local materials that are in there, um, they don't have that mechanism. Um, you can write, if they have the means and the ability to do it, they will go in and actually do a kind of a physical inspection of the scans. Um, we use Peter Hurdle's chart um, to help give us guidance on what we can open. Um, and they will go in and, and review it and then open the materials. But basically, it's the digitized, it's, a, it's a, tons of volumes and materials out of these um, uh, schools. And it's not just government information. We in the government info world quickly glommed on to Hathi because we're like, oh my goodness, they've scanned a lot of really fantastic historic materials from these different government uh, jurisdiction. So really, it's if you're not aware of it and not using it, I'd recommend. The only downside is if you're not a partner, because um, I think you have to actually log in to download um, materials, some of those materials, you only get kind of that limited view. We're a partner. We haven't contributed scans at this point, but we are a partner, so we can get access to it. Um, so, Hathi Trust actually has a mechanism for state agencies to submit saying, yes, all our materials are Creative Commons, they're public domain, um, you can open them, and you can imagine how well that goes over with when you put that in front of a state agency. The only state agency who has signed it has been the main state library that got the authority. Anyone here from Maine? Yeah. That's oh, off yeah. to you. Go Maine. Um, saying that they had the authority to sign that and they are using a CC0, so public domain Creative Commons license for their materials in here and their materials that, they, that they're doing their own scanning. Um, so this is how Hockey Trust came to be kind of a partner with us because we were giving them feedback saying, we can't get an agency to sign this. There's got to be a different way. And so that's been our driving force is to say there's got to be a different way. We have to have change and we have to figure out a more comprehensive way to do it. Um, what we try to do on the site is to promote those uh, states like Maine who do something like this and say, fantastic job. Look at this. It can be done and to, I call it publicly shame, um, when there are, California, that bill, AB 2880, uh, we put it up there, this is a step in the wrong direction. So at this point, um, trying to just kind of monitor when these types of pieces of legislation come up, um, when there are news items about this type of stuff, we're trying to get it out there. Um, I'll have to say again, we're a small group, so we're actually looking for people who would even want to be involved in helping us with kind of scanning the landscape to monitor and then go out and make contact and do the praising and the shaming. <laughs> Is that it? I know, I know that's great. So, okay. So it was more than just two words. <laughs> <laughs> I expected. I didn't think it would be. That would be two sentences. Yes. No. <laughs> Um, all right, speaking of praising and shaming and things of that nature, do you want to talk a little bit about what OpenGov Foundation has done and sure. some of the great work and challenges that you run into? I will do my best. I thought you were going to take shaming in a different direction. No. Yeah. <laughs> ah, got that joke since kindergarten. Um, thank you. Thank you all for having me here. You know, we, we few, we happy few, we copyright of law reformers. Um, it's pretty remarkable and wonderful that you guys are this strong of a community. Um, I've come to learn about copyright law by getting my hands dirty. Um, the, the Open Gut Foundation grew out of Congress, and our mission is to build 21st century legislatures. So if our legislatures in a democratic free society are the first branch 
um, they should be the most badass branch out there. They should have the best possible access, the best possible tools, and the best possible means of production. And so my, my, my story of, uh, of woe and sadness when it comes to copyrighted law is very practical. It's trying to help legislatures, of which Congress is one, transform their internal operations and culture from the speed of paper <coughs> and all of its limits to the internet age to digital. Um, like Hair Club for Men, I, I say I'm not just a co-founder, the Open God Foundation. I was also our first client. Um, as we were working in Congress, my co-founder is a sitting congressman still. He just was re-elected Congressman Darrell Issa. Um, and when SOPA and PIPA hit this big internet freedom thing around copyright, um, we were out of time, out of money, and we just didn't have the tools to handle all of the incoming. And so we built our first tool that was essentially opening up the legislative process, digitizing paper so that experts in the public could interact with it. It went well, and then we said, great, let's get this into more people's hands. Now, I saw somebody on the list from Maryland. Are there Marylanders in here? Right on. Um, so the first thing we did, because Elijah Cummings was our ranking member on the House Oversight Committee, and we knew Maryland a little well, is we said, gee, we're going to go start this nonprofit and go out to the state of Maryland and try to you know, implement this digital tool, um, ran up against uh, the Department of Legislative Services, but ultimately transformed Maryland state code into an open legal data set. Um, after Virginia, I know you guys are all fans of Waldo Jacleth, um, but after Virginia, Maryland was the second state to have its law available in, a, in an open structured format. Um, but then a curious thing happened on the way to copyright. Um, we had to public information act request uh, the actual source file so that we could take paper and turn it into structured open data. And it came with 70 odd uh, chapter titles, so like environment, education, and then six to nine hundred, sometimes more, pages of, of text underneath it. Uh, but when I went to LexisNexis, I saw this neat structure and catch titles and section summaries. And I went back to the Legislative Services Department and said, what, what, what's going on here? And they said, oh, that's our publisher, that's our contractor. They added all that stuff. And I'm like, well, great, can I just kind of, can we run a scraper and bring it over? And they said, I'm going to pretend you didn't say that. Um, go look up this thing called copyright of law. Um, and here I am today. Um, one of my fun facts is we ended up saying, uh, screw it, we'll do it live. And uh, we wrote 33,000 and change catch titles for the Maryland Code of Law. Um, those are still waiting in a file somewhere for a gift to the state legislature. So if you want some free catch titles for your official code, <laughs> you let me know. Um, but that's, that's how we got into it, right, from a practical format. Um, and what, what we're doing today is taking those pillars of a 21st century law and legislative production environment for those inside of government and bring it around the country. So our main, main projects are in uh, Chicago and with the US Congress. Um, now, when I've gotten to know you guys a little bit and the state and local level issues here, um, we, we're really hands-on in trying to hack around the, the prohibitions and the laws that exist today. Um, that extends from uh, quietly seeking passage of an Edicts of Government Act to make all of this hopefully go away all at once on the federal level um, but then some really, really fun and interesting ways to get around that uh, with cities like uh, the Washington, D.C. Uh, government and uh, New York City Council. Um, with that, I guess I'll, uh, I'll shut up a little bit because I really do want to hear from you guys. Um, and I guess in, in closing, I come, I'm not a lawyer. I do play one at conferences and on TV. Um, as Ed from D.C. knows, I'm not an engineer either. Although I do play a software developer sometimes. Um, but if I've learned nothing more over the last three years of our existence, it's that we can't get that 21st century government that's accessible, that's functional, that's participatory and inclusive, and actually builds the right policy outcomes without everybody in this room, the engineers, the lawyers, the advocates, the librarians, I choose to call them book wizards, um, all, working, all working together. And I'm, I'm just thankful that you guys exist and you've been working on this a lot longer than I have. And I, I put my cell phone number up there, that's my real number. Um, you have in the handouts my, uh, my social media and my email, but uh, for serious, we're, we're in the business of hacking problems and if you've got data, that you want to open up in an un, un, unrestrict 
uh, in clever, uh, clever ways. Uh, I would love to stay in touch, and uh, now I consider ourselves friends. So with that, with that. Well, can you give Seamus the, the example of DC um, or New York City or both um, to kind of paint the picture of what happened there? Sure, um, I can. Uh, so I'll start with DC. Um, so DC is the first and only uh, that I am aware of city on earth that has its, uh, its law, and I can actually pull that up, I tab prepped here, um, in an open format available online and as the official version. Um, this has been in the works for a couple years, it's been a huge team effort, um, but it took a lot longer than it should have. So actually, uh, did, you, did you reference the Free Law Innovation Fellow? Yep. Perhaps. So Ed's outfit, ours, a foundation in Texas called the Arnold Foundation, and the D.C. government actually put some uh, money down on the table to hire a free law innovation fellow, so a really talented engineer, to uh, build internal tools for codification and publishing for the District uh, of Columbia so that it could break free of the, the, the sort of codependent vendor relationship and kind of cut that whole LexisNexis structure, color, all of the various things that they can copyright uh, out of the equation and just start from the source, right? That's, where, that's what we do in that production process at the OpenGov Foundation. That's like a benefit of, of digital first, digital throughout. Um, when we ran up against uh, Lexis, because Lexis, being smart behemoths that they are, uh, they've been following us and knew exactly what we're doing and where we're going. And they just said, well, pound sand. We're not going to give you uh, the, the code files we are contractually obligated to deliver to you. Right? The contract <coughs> says text, PDF, Word, HTML. And they said, we'll send you flat image file PDFs. Good luck. Um, and said, literally, sue us. And by the time that resolves itself, we'll, we'll be out of here. Um, so we were able to actually work based off of source data from some civic hacking groups that had taken a couple years ago, structured those in a couple different versions. We did one, another group did another. That got us most of the way there. And then since then, um, the folks inside the DC Council have literally been rebuilding their own law by hand. Um, but finally, it is at a point, if you go all the way to the bottom, as I know good lawyers always do, um, these are in the public domain. Please do not scrape because you can download the HTML or structured XML file and it's current and it's official and it's the whole shebang. That's the world we're trying to build. And Ed? Shame is surely a project of this magnitude took hundreds of programmers and IT people. Thousands, and actually. That's not the kind of thing that any state or city could do by themselves, right? Oh, I mean, this this was actually a thousand times more difficult than uh, saving healthcare.gov. Just no. Uh, <laughs> this, this, this is a product of uh, a developer over the course of a year. Now he was building off of work that had been started by a guy who I think you're all big fans of, Dave Svenich, um, way back when. Um, it took a year, and he built it. And now we're working with him to find the second and the third place. Um, and if you open the data, right, all the software and the process fits together from drafting. So drafting new laws or, or uh, modifying existing ones or writing regulations all the way through publication, getting that seamless pipeline. That's what the OpenGov Foundation does. And Dave Greeson, the Free Law Innovation Fellow, has built that codification pillar. Follow-up question, sir. But surely, after all that work, the District of Columbia has locked down the software so no one else can use it, right? Um, would, surely you can't be serious. Stop telling me surely. Um, the answer is, David, the, the, most of the software is open source. Where they're going now is they're actually doing a vendor. So it is not, the software itself is not open source yet. I think that that's probably where it will end up. But suffice it to say, what the work that happened under that one year fellowship with a couple other developers could catch right up and we'd have a full on open source front to back system. Um, all of this saying like, this is not hard anymore. Thanks to the work you guys have been doing. Um, really, a really active and exciting community has grown up around this and they like want to hear from you. They want to work with that data. And we're so darn close to actually building the means of production 
so that a lot of these issues just aren't, aren't issues anymore. I fear this is a generational question, but I saw somebody at the bottom of your site that said, please do not scrape. I would try to respect that, but I have no idea what scraping and not scraping is. <laughs> to scrape or not to scrape, that is the question. Anybody want to tackle that? What is scraping? It's like it's running a Unix script that goes in every single link and pulls the characters. Yeah, it's essentially copying all the text okay. and everything on the page and putting it into a database so that you can go do other stuff with it. If um, we're, if we're familiar with Connor Malmood, at least by this point in the day, um, that's what he's been doing since before it was cool, or before you got sued for it. Free Law Project is writing scrapers for people. So if you're familiar with Free Law Project, they're in your packet as well. Um, they're behind, um, I think, Sarah, you mentioned one of their projects today. But that's part of what they're doing is they're building these <coughs> scraping tools for people to go in and pull court records down and kind of conti contribute to the corpus. Um, so they're publishing a lot of this up on GitHub. Mm -hmm. um, some of it does take you know a little bit of technical know-how, but there are plenty of people yeah. out there who, if you handed that over to them, could do it and you could learn too. <laughs> so if I don't know what scraping is, I'm probably not doing it. You got to find out. Well, unless you're just right clicking and downloading, that's kind of the old school way that people used to, you know, scrape. Um, there's also like Google or who I think Chrome has a plugin. It's called Download It All that you can just say, give me everything, give me all the image files off this site, give me all the, the PDF links off this site, and it pulls the link and the the actual file yeah. down. What is that called again? Uh, download them all. <laughs> yeah, there, there, are, there are a number of things here. I mean, scraping is a good middle step, I think. Um, it's something that we found is, right, it's not, a, we wouldn't be doing this if, it, if that was a sustainable solution. For a very long time, the Sunlight Foundation ran this thing called the Open States Project. Um, that was just a big mess of scrapers running on state websites. Um, the problem is, every time the underlying information changes, so anytime any of those sites gets updated, you then have to do an incredibly intent, manually intensive process of then updating those scraping tools to catch up. So you're going to really, I know authentication, verification, if I've learned anything and did, that's really important. All those commas matter. Um, and you just, you never, there's, you never get 100%. It's like the singularity. You'll never get 100% uh, accuracy with scraping. Um, and uh, that's why, you know, Fast case, or that's why we're doing in many ways what we're doing. I saw a hand. Yeah. There. Mr. Walters? Say, just one, one thing, more thing about scraping. Um, so, again, from a, from a kind of publisher side, like every night, uh, Westlaw and LexisNexis and Fast Case and Bloomberg and everyone else visits every one of these sites and does this operation where you visit every page on the site and download everything and compare it to see if there's any changes. That's nuts. Which is yeah. why this uh, program in DC, where they say, like, just download it all here with this single XML link that just gives you all the information, is so much smarter. Yeah. Instead of going every day and downloading the entire DC code, I'll show you what that looks and comparing like. it against the whole DC code, you now get an alert mm -hmm. saying there's been a change, and this is the change. Yeah. Uh, and you can just download it in a single file, yeah. which is amazing. All right it's here. better also for researchers so, to have that. Look at that. So yeah. they last published 22 days ago. And so it gives you one of those most recent and all that good stuff. Um, we're close. We're really close. I mean, this is this is something that everybody should raise a glass uh, tonight and, and going mm -hmm. forward and cheer on um, because it really is that major, major spearhead through the copyright wall without having to change the law. Does the DC code uh, incorporate any standards or third-party software by uh, or uh, copyrighted material by reference? The source code, like the actual, what we're looking at here, does not. The code of regulations does. Um, we're obviously not there yet, but that's coming. And there, there are some interesting approaches to de copyright restricting that. Um, one which. A certain congressman I know is perhaps entertained uh, in, in times past is, all right, take all of them in a big old box or 10, walk down to the well of the U.S. House of Representatives, and I rise, may I read this into the record, and everything right there is public domain. Um, might not be the most uh, cooperative 
way to get around that, but that's an option. Um, and I think that, that like, that's the sort of stuff that at least excites me. I sort of try to lean towards the, the, the New Testament God, right? Slow to anger and rich in kindness. But, you know, those thunderbolts are there. And this is like, this issue right here gets me out of bed in the morning, makes me just angry as hell. But that also, channeling that into useful uh, ways to hack around these restrictions, such as reading everything into the congressional record. Um, right, you don't actually have to read the whole thing. The speaker will say, it's so ordered. And then all, everything in those boxes becomes public domain. Could happen. Publishing output of agencies. Yeah. And you could just, like, I don't know, everybody in this room could go home and, like, give a box to their congressman. Be like, hey, go just read this first sentence into the record, and the speaker will give you a gavel. And boom, everything in this file is, is open. Are we sure about that? Yeah. Yeah. So like any art, like so like someone reads a newspaper article yep. and then yes. Extension of yeah. ours. Yeah. I, I, I understand the I was, concept. I'm I was, really not it's speech sure. it's the speech and debate clause. I was I was very so the, skeptical of so this. The Congress person can't be sued. But then if you republish it. Oh well let me, let, let, me, let me reiterate into the recorded microphone. I'm not a lawyer. And uh, like <laughs> our footer says, seriously, we're not attorneys at all. In the hearings um, was that concern. Yeah. And there's been tons of debate around that very issue of if something gets read into record, either or in a, a hearing, a congressional hearing, and someone provides testimony, and they happen to read from a copyrighted article or something, that's why Google put the brakes on, we're not going to release uh, federal hearings, because there's the, p the potential for copyrighted information in there, and us getting sued is too high, which... Right. It's, it's getting into the congressional record. So when they when you read it and they said so ordered, everything in that box will then get printed up or digitally produced in the congressional record for the for that day. And anything in the congressional record is it's now a federal data set, so it is not copyrightable. Um, consult an attorney, yeah. but okay. yeah, I've I've seen it happen before with uh, let's say documents that were leaked but were not uh, you know were not public. And uh, those were in the middle of a big stack of things. And when it was read into the record, everything that had yet to be published or produced as part of the subpoena uh, response uh, was boom, open for everybody. What about part of the code that was published by Lexis? Um, I, again, I, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yes. 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 <laughs> it should be. <laughs> God, you attorneys, you've got you've trained me. Come on, you can't untrain me. It almost seems too good. I mean, like, it's, it like, is, I can't believe, it's like, an option. <laughs> it's an option that's out there, perhaps a nuclear one, but it's out there. I, mean, I, I get like if you're Okay, all right. Yes. So complicated. Yes. Like, uncomplicated. Yes. <laughs> Go find a constitution. Someone write an article. Yes. <laughs> write an article. Yes, sir. This is for Chris. Um, I was wondering whether you work with any state depository librarians or libraries themselves that have state depository collections and um, worrying about copyright for non-legal materials? Yes, I have. Um, and it's interesting, it's an interesting group. Um, so there's the Best Practices Exchange group, um, and that is primarily all state library, uh, state libraries and archives who are typically the kind of runners of deposit state depository programs. Right. Um, Sometimes they're concerned, sometimes they're not. We've gotten different takes on it. Um, even public libraries who have been digit they are digitizing this material, it's not that this is holding them up. They just say, well, it's government information and it's public domain, and if someone wants to come and challenge us, so be it. We're putting it up, we'll put a takedown notice and go forward. So that's been what I've experienced a lot of um, these libraries who have depository collections, they may not be the state library, but they may be the public library. They've just kind of said, this is how we're approaching it. No one has advised us otherwise. And if there's a problem, we'll have a discussion with the agency that wants us to take it down. So I think um, one of the kind of the challenges with this particular issue, especially dealing with the publications, the, the non like primary legal publications, most people are kind of like, eh, that's really not that big a deal, and in the grand scheme of all of our other issues, I'm getting a budget cut, I gotta move a collection, 
you know, this is kind of low on my priority list of things to worry about. Um, so that's, that's been some of the response, um, some of the kind of feedback that we've gotten. People feel, oh yeah, it's an issue, but you know, we got to figure out a way to push past it. So, you know, I'm a huge supporter of, I know several libraries who are doing this and they didn't want to have a deep conversation with me about it, nor did they want to publish their approach like on our blog, because they're just like, we're just going to do this. This is how we're handling it. We're, you know, we're done. Because it seems to me that with so many state publications these days being online only, you need to be able to um, make that available to people for your depository status to mean anything. And so you need to have that type of archive or, um, you know, folding yep. place with digital materials. So that's the other um, issue that we've been grappling with is the web archiving. Um, so once agencies no longer had to go through kind of an official state printer of sorts, right, because that used to be kind of a catch-all mechanism, was a, an, an official state printer or publishing office. Um, they typically had a way to make sure that the libraries received those publications. I know in California with the Paperwork Reduction Acts, they got rid of that requirement. They could go to any, you know, printer that would be cost effective for them. So the ability for that you know, private printer to know that, oh, we got to print an extra 20 copies to send to these, but that went out the window like way back in the 80s. So in California, we've been grappling with distribution issues for quite some time. But then once you get the um, online publication, agencies put it up, check the box, we're done with, pub you know, publishing, don't care about the long-term permanent preservation and permanent public access to this stuff. That's not what we're required to do. Um, many state libraries and archives are taking on the web archiving to be able to do that work to make sure that there are copies of this material um, out there. Washington State is actually another good example. Many years ago, um, I think it was probably back in, I even had to write an article for Documents to the People. Um, they were able to get a, a statute passed that required any agency who was publishing an article to upload a copy of that document into this like document management system. So that way they were continuing kind of that deposit program. But I mean, I'll be honest with you, most like state depository programs are kind of dead in the water with online distribution unless those acts have any teeth to require agencies to deposit with the state agency. Most do not. So those libraries, I know it, Bernadette, who's in Michigan, they are trying to go out and you know bring that in. They feel it is their responsibility to steward it and preserve it and provide access. But it's, um, that's also quite a mess as well. Thank you. Yeah. Come on. I have a question for Seamus. Uh, have you worked with Municode? Um, which is the organization that publishes most uh, state codes? I'm sorry, uh, local ordinances. The answer is yes. Yeah. They would be the little one hanging down here. Um, we do, if this map needs to be updated, but uh, for the dots you see, the uh, codifier with which we've worked extensively and really, really well, because they're awesome, is American uh, Legal Publishing out of Cincinnati. Steve Wolf is the head there. If you don't know him, you should. Um, they're, they're awesome, and I've learned a lot about what we're talking about here today just by interacting with him and his team. Right? Their policy stance is uh, the law is the property in, of the people of our client community or county, and it's, we're just here to get it out there in the best way possible with the broadest possible access given where we are with technology and, and data. And we just happen to come along and at the right time and say, wow, you know, they're lawyers, we're technologists and coming together, like you guys can all do here right when you get home. Well, maybe you know, say hi to your special someone first. But after that, you can go find a technologist and do something similar with. Um, Minicode, we, um, we explored what it looked like. Um, Similar-ish policy stance but definitely some divergences. Um, and really, it's you can FOIA it or PIA it if you need to. Do you really want to do that? Right? Do you really want to fight that fight, like the do-gooders 
kids from the internet, as I call us, like trying to increase public access to the most important information for a community like Miami. We really want to fight that fight. Um, and so we were able to, to get that data out and keep that one going. Um, given we are a small, scrappy nonprofit, we, uh, we have to make resource decisions on where we go next. Uh, and that was just a lot more work than working with American Legal. Yeah. With um, American Legal or Municode publishers, one of the things that we've come across is that they don't have any type of file of the recently um, you know, denied or uh, recently um, passed but no longer enforced legislation. Like session law type stuff or? Well, they're not going to produce a file that has the stuff from like 2005 right. today. That's a huge problem. And right. that stuff is essentially gone from all of us. It's on, it's on, it's on in big binders on the shelves. Yeah, it probably is. And some of it might be in an internet archive, but not enough. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, it's funny. I mean, that's a pro literally a product of, of the workflow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, we've gone a number of times to just watch how the magic, if we want to call it, that happens, like the codification and the publication process. And it's a, it's a, it's a WYSIWYG editor, right? It's right. two screens side by side with the existing code on that gorgeous, and I'm sarcastic, NXT folio front end, and the new stuff coming in, and then an open binder of the code in front of them, and they're literally going back and forth. It's really labor intensive. Like, they can do so much more. They could touch so many more people. They could get so many more clients with a more efficient system that was digital first, instead of having to manually type in all of these things. Um, that's part of the reason I think you know, an organization like them look at look at an opportunity to work with us positively. Is like we know, and they you know they they've said it themselves. We know that this has got to change. We know we're still that's a paper based system still. We know we got to move, but we don't know how to do it. That's okay. It's just most people aren't comfortable, like they are, saying, hey, help. And once that hand goes up, like, you get back so much more in return. But that's why. And I would put that in the bucket it exists. Like, I'm sure Unicode in Tallahassee has a bunch of shelves, too. Uh, but that's just going to be an Internet Archive style scan and, uh, scan and scrape um, to start to get all that in back in time. But... That's just a, a product of being limited by the speed of paper. Yeah. How many people were updating those and not keep, I mean, the, the agencies themselves, the cities have the complete historical runs. Right. We, at UCLA, we were a depository for Muni codes for quite some time. We were even in the state statutes as being one. Um, and we get this, you know, this association of city clerks would call us up and say, hey, I'm supposed to be sending you these updates. I don't think we've been doing that for like 10 years, so I'm going to start sending them. So then we have incomplete binders, and uh, we, again, we were superseding pages out. So trying to assemble a really nice historic run of meaning codes, um, that's been another kind of project that early on in my days as a state and local government librarian, I really was like, we got to do something about this, but it's that's a, another massive um, yeah. Undertaking. Yeah, it is too massive. It's too massive for us as the State Law Library in Maryland. We have all of the um, print codes that we can have, and we have all of the links to the online codes that we know of. And there's just no way that we have the space to keep going yeah. and backfilling that older stuff. Well, where there's a will, there's a way. It sounds like there's a will. Um, it just takes time. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things we encounter all, all the time, right? It's like, do we, do we not do anything? Or do we just start from a point and go forward and then go back? And it depends place to place. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, love, I, I, I will gift you a big CD file of, of all, those, uh, <laughs> all those catch titles, and, and I'll follow up with you on that. Um, oh, cool. Way back. Two questions. Um, number one, does AAAA have an official policy on copyright of primary legal materials or on access to primary legal information? And number two, for Seamus, how can law libraries, law schools work with you or in general advocate to make more places do what DC has done? 
So I'll take number one. Yes, we do. Um, it's part of our government relations policy, which I will pull up if you go to aallnet.org slash GRO, which is government relations. Um, we have a government relations policy under 3B. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> here. Um, public domain status of government publications. Um, government information, including the text of all primary legal materials, dot, 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 must be in the public domain and available to the public without restriction. AAAL supports a general prohibition against copyright restrictions on government works. AAAL opposes any copyright claims, restricted licenses, restricted licenses royalty arrangements, statutory regular, regulatory revisions, or interpretations of federal, state, or local laws and regs that restrict access to or the use or reuse of government information. So yes. Mm -hmm. So yes, we just got it. Um, if it needs to be not in email, um, give me a call or shoot me a text. But the first thing to do is reach out. Um, you know, all my information is in the, the book that we got. Uh, Twitter works, email works. If you send a passenger pigeon to the District of Columbia, I can give you my address. Um, it's to start. Uh, it's to start there. Um, and that's, we could start, right, just, hey, go here and dump files here, um, but we really try to make sure that we're doing right by whomever we're working with. So just in case there are any of those little poison pills, let's, let's look at it, let's try to figure out what a sustainable system looks like. But this state-decoded software that Walda Jake was started, and the middle step format there is kind of built for that use case, right? We, better is better is one of our operating philosophies. And paper or state decoded is not a like beautiful structured everything open and, and open data, but it's way better than a PDF. It's way better than an HTML file. It's way better than a book, and it's a great middle step, especially if you're looking at building those uh, those coalitions and uh, and backers to make this a far larger endeavor. Because really, what we're all talking about here and grappling with is transforming our legislatures and all of the fun information they consume and produce from paper to digital. And that's just a huge, huge industry-wide change that we are, I don't even want to estimate how early we are, but we're so early um, that we'd love to work with you and, and rip it, decode it, and uh, start building on top of it. There's actually a really interesting use case. I don't know if anybody here, is Colorado still here? I said, yeah, I mean, I, first off, right on, I, you could have given my was, inspirational talk. I was going to say, yeah, you were um, But, and you may be aware of this, Colorado, it was Colorado, Virginia, and Ohio. There was an e-bench book project, you guys should look at that. It's a slice of the legal code. Uh, and the one where there were restrictions initially or concerns was with Colorado, but I don't know if it was your office or somebody worked through those and said, no, totally fine, we'll give it to you in writing. But it was for judges who are doing election law cases and uh, are at a resource uh, disparity with those arguing the cases in front of them to actually have the same assets and information that the litigants have. Yeah, that was a really interesting project. It wasn't us. Uh, Jennifer Gilroy is the advisor of staff. Yeah, okay. In Colorado, and for a long time, she had the requirement to copyright annotations and recently had that removed. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, legislature. Now does not copyright even yeah. stuff. And uh, I think the beauty of projects, whether it's decoded or what DC is doing or this, is it's a working model and it's real. And because nine times out of ten, or usually more than that in our world, it's open source. It's it, the hard stuff has been done at least once, and it's so. And I can speak from painful experience. Maryland was hard as hell just because it was our first one, right? And then our second one was Baltimore. Baltimore was a lot easier. It still wasn't easy because they were, they're still using WordPerfect. <laughs> and doing it all by hand, but we have a WordPerfect scraping system. I wish that I'd known that a little bit. But like, you, you start where you are. Um, and the third one, Chicago, was a lot easier. And the fourth one, San Francisco, was way easier. And now we kind of got a system. And that's how the technology and the process grows and changes. And, I think a lot of that hard stuff, just like you guys have done over the last however many number of years you've been in this game, you're making it a hell of a lot easier for those coming in. That's that's open source. So, Seamus, have you talked with Jennifer Gilroy? 
Uh, I'm emailed with her. Uh, yeah, initially, and then the reason I asked that question is, I mean, obviously the, the connection to the EE bench book it, it, in elections, it, I think it's constitutional. By the way, it's, it's Article One, it's, it's the first or Title One. But um, she is doing that uphill run right now, where currently they're using an SGML system based on work perfect, and they need that help, and she's doing it an in-house proprietary uh, dynamic XML project. Um, and I think the two of you should probably. Could you connect us? I'd be Absolutely. happy to take it's some in my there. notes. I've got a star awesome. right <laughs> I'll do a circle around it and an underline, too. <laughs> um, but, but I think she'd be a willing uh, partner in that. I just don't know to what extent her um, her IT team is already down that road, but I know that we can short circuit that trip with mutual benefit. Well, we'd love to help. Um, one thing before I forget, though, and it's, it's to this point, um, that other you know, city anecdote in New York City. Um, it all centered around contracts. And this is another thing that I'm sure everybody here is aware of, but when you have that contract up and are doing your RFP, that's while we wait for Congress to do its its business at its August glacial pace. Um, as Daryl Issa likes to say, Congress does two things. Well, nothing and overreact. <laughs> uh, so while, while that's happening or not, um, Another thing like to, to, is to get it in your RFP. And so the New York City Council, Council Member Ben Kalos, totally great guy, pioneer on this stuff, um, said, great, I'm going to pass a law. That it's called the Law, law Online Act that's up curiously in front of me. Um, and it will say that at our next contract, whenever that's up, and we knew it was up in about a year, when this came in, uh, came before the council, it must be published in an open machine readable, non-proprietary, bulk downloadable, and accessible via API format whenever the next contract kicks in. And the next contract kicked in after this went through and the RFP said you've got to do it. And boom, that's how like, you got the change. Um, they had a similar situation with New York Legal Publishing. New York Legal Publishing said, pound sand. We know we're contractually obligated, but we're not going to help out you or the next vendor. See ya. Um, and that caused a delay, but ultimately, you know, we were able to start with that scrape file, and then American Legal came in and did its magic, and there's another example of, of how to do it. And I know, I know how, uh, how being first in government isn't always cool, but everybody wants to be second. And I think that's another good example of how you can actually use contracts, changing the, act the city's code in an RFP to get the same result, even if we're still in this copyright desert. Are you going to do the NYPD patrol guide, which was just passed? Very <coughs> pardon? The NYPD patrol guide, which um, just came I wouldn't. Passed. American Legal Publishing and the New York City Council probably would. Um, we're not directly involved in that anymore, which is awesome. Like that's our that's success. Success for us is always kicking the keys over to the ecosystem, and it doesn't have to be just the government. Like New York City has more choices and options now that it can do it itself, like DC is. It can go out and get a, a well-intentioned, sort of good-hearted vendor like American Legal. It's just so many more options depending on the on the situation, which I think is the goal here without forcing people to do it one way, which is unfortunately how I think so much of this has come up in the first place. Gotta do it the one way. Yeah, once you hear one way, I always like, ding. If I've learned nothing about software, it's like, oh, if someone says there's only one way to do it, they're probably not telling the whole story. James, you said that the um, America Decoded platform source code is not open source. That one is, yes. The DC codification tool, so for the codification piece of that four step process, which is drafting, public engagement, codification, and publication, that's your legislative operating system right there. Um, the codification piece that's been built uh, in, inside the DC Council is not itself open source, but it consumes and produces open structured machine readable legal data, which I've learned, right? Open data is greater than the open source. Um, I know folks in my sort of civic tech community might fight me over that sentence, 
but really it's it's less the software license than it is is the data open and restriction free coming in and coming out and and that's what dc does but yeah the state decoded that's about as restriction free as you're going to get that's all open source everything we do is open source so is the dc tool would that be interoperable for other situations uh yeah well because what you're looking at here is this is the result right this is the published result this is a very basic website this is any website would work for this. It's the, the means of production, the codification platform that made this possible is not is proprietary right now. But that may change. Any last question? Great. Oh, okay. Steve. Sorry. Um, the DC code, it reminds me that didn't DC pass ULMA? Mm -hmm. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Dave Zenich, our friend, is, is was very close. Be, is this going to be um, archivable according to the ULMA standards? Um, I don't know the details. I mean, ULMA does not require electronic preservation. I can tell you that. Um, I do know that Dave was working very closely and hard to make DC ULMA compliant without the passage of ULMA, which hadn't happened yet. Though we do expect, hopefully, ULMA to pass post haste very soon. That was the authentication component Correct. I was working on. It's yeah, more it's the authentication issues what's built into ULMA. That's key. Yeah, right. yeah and that, that is a basic feature of the application tool, is to publish that ULMA compliant information. And there are a couple great ULMA compliant tools out there, including Data Seal, which is one of the ones that, that Dave Spinach yeah. um, and Waldo worked on as well. So another hand. Yes, Mark, ma last question. Chris, I wonder if you uh, would reiterate um, what help the Free State Government Information Initiative needs, needs. from the community. Yes, I can. I have my list. You get it. <laughs> I'm also pulling up the Get Involved page. <laughs> There's the Get Involved. Um, so what we tried to, what we need are people who could help us because there is clearly a demonstrated need by people out there that we've talked to to have some kind of sample legislation, model legislation. If I were to take this, even uh, librarians who are, you know, just public librarians who feel this is an important cause, if I was to go have a conversation with my, you know, state assembly member, what would I want to put in front of them, um, right? Because we want to make sure we give them guidance. Ideally, something that is very simple, kind of like Section 105 for federal documents. We want to make sure, because this is the problem we found, is a lot of this legislation that comes up, it's all garbled, and there's like all these weird provisions and exceptions and stuff. So we really could use someone who is able to help with kind of putting that language together so we can get it up on the website, and people can come and take it, and that can be part of our advocacy toolkit. I would love for anyone who could, you know, who is out there in their states or in their um, municipalities who are aware of issues. I mean, I can't wait. I'm going to put links to what the work that you're doing up there to show kind of what projects are out there and are working. And then again, I, I'm all for the kind of, hey, watchdog, this isn't, you know, the, the state has got a piece of legislation up. It's problematic. It's going to, you know, inhibit um, access to either publications or laws, I would love to have people just be willing to contribute to, um, you know, blog posts about that. Um, anyone who's willing to, we've got, I think it's in Ohio, there's one person who, we just had back channel emails about, he's like, all right, I've identified my legislators, we're going in, we're talking to them, um, and we're like, how, what do you need from us to help support you? So I think helping to build a community of people who are within the states and know their states, um, both their uh, legislative processes, if they have connections, I think that's one of the biggest issues are the connections. So if you have got connections with people, with lawmakers, or someone who could move this issue along, at the local level, at the state level. I mean, I feel like state and local, it, it's the same problem and same set of issues. Where you have that in to kind of push this, we could really, we'd want to connect with you. We'd like to keep track of what you're doing and kind of help bolster and support that kind of work. So really, we need people who could help us draft some language, 
keep the website up and, you know, the, the blog posts up and running, keep tabs on what's happening out there, and then also have the ability or the connections and the networks to, to start channeling and change. Amen. Yeah, I think that's one of the, coming out of Congress, right, where everything is purely political and incentive alignment, um, having things like this, so this is that engagement piece of the four-part system to run a legislature, having things like this that any elected official can immediately look at and see and write press releases and get good government or transparency points or leadership, whatever they get on TV, like all of those types of, I don't know, I call it like elected official candy, that would then make this not just a good thing for them to do otherwise, but also understandable, like why is this important? Well, you can't do this, which you're enjoying, until you make this policy change at scale um, is also something I think we can jam on yeah. a lot. Yeah. I mean, a closing anecdote is I got to meet Governor Brown, and I said, hey, I'm you know, the state government information librarian here at Stanford. He's like, oh, that's great. You know, I'm like, you know, they're not all in the public domain. He's like, what? That's crazy. Of course they are. And I was like, well, can we have a conversation when you're not running out the door to your next engagement? Um, so, you know, if, if there's ways to, for you and your states to have those conversations and really get those talking points in front of them to show, because I think, you know, once it's presented in this very, in the kind of a very simple, rational way, I'm hopeful, I want to be on the hopeful side that there, that people will be like, yeah, that, that makes sense. I, it, this is kind of a no-brainer. I know in the state of California, we've identified a few legislators who would be sympathetic to this kind of thing, and they look at it as good governance and transparency, and the open data movement, I think, is also something that we can start to kind of, I say, glom onto, but those conversations are already happening with the open data movement, so I'm like, well, can we just also include the publications and, you know, the, the primary legal materials? Let's look at it more holistically. Glom well, onto it. You're already part of it. We're already part of it. <laughs> yeah. yes. um, no, thank you guys for, for having us here, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, I really do look up to you, literally. Uh, but we would not be doing what we're doing at the level that we're doing without the work you guys have been doing for a lot longer. So thank you and, and keep it up. And I'd just like to close with what, what, what it all matters here. So when we started decoding places and then getting people asking questions and asking for user support, um, the first people who always came were the government lawyers saying, you know, I don't need to fight through that stupid system 15 tabs down to get the thing I need. I can get a link right to it, that's awesome. And then the second people are people who do things like uh, low-income housing assistance, low-income legal assistance, um, people who are looking for translations of the law because say a child was arrested and they're not English, native English speakers. That's the point of all of this, is increasing that utility and access. And that's a, that's a straight up civil rights issue for our time. And I'm really glad to be in this fight with you guys. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, very briefly, what I want to do is summarize some of the things that I heard today, give you some thoughts about what to do going forward, and end with a suggestion about what we do immediately once I'm done talking. All right? This is all very exciting. So first thing is um, thank you all. I think this is awesome. NCC SLM for the win. I was really excited about the challenge of putting this together, chairing the committee. I had spectacular people helping me do it spectacular presenters doing it, and Emily every step of the way reminding me we have deadlines and deliverables, and we met all of those, so that's, that's awesome, right? And, and so we kick things off, of course, here at BU with the dean talking, even though she wasn't here, she was able to give us a really good intro and, of course, a spectacular space, wonderful to come here, go downstairs, wonderful view of everything to look to see. Um, the outside world um, and have conversations at the table. And one thing she reminded us, of course, is, you know, in her area, UCC is um, copyright, right? It's not um, CC. And also the other thing that UCC is not is it is not uh, public domain, right? So that's, this is the challenge. These are some of the things that we're going to have to think about. Um, Wendy, of course, then um, 
talk to us about um, the important thing here. Um, <laughs> I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree, but what it is that we here saw was something known to us as law. <laughs> you made that up. Um, yeah. 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 So we see that. Um, the other thing is, inspired by Kyle's work, this is the thing that we're all working towards, yes. right? We want the entire map to be green. We want the needle to go to four. Screw 11, we're just going to go to four. That's all we need, right? So we want to do that, including Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and other things like that, right? So we want to do that. Um, our first keynote speaker, of course, was here to talk about the important work that um, her organization is doing, walk us through a lot of the high-level concepts, and introduce a lot of the cases that are there. And of course, as these important controversies come up, and we need people to help us represent these needs, Corinne's there to basically say F you to the people that are going to try to challenge um, some of these things that we're trying to do, right? So then the next thing we saw here um, from the next group going on was um, with, um, let's see who he is, Jessica um, Tottenham was exploring a little bit about this idea of poetry, and she said, well, actually, the poetry piece might not actually be true, but what she did say, of course, is that law inspires love, hate, fear, passion, but it isn't poetry. And it's that love, hate, fear, and passion that we're inspiring and trying to connect here. We know it's not poetry, and we know it shouldn't be protected by copyright. We should be making it more available. A concept um, that um, Chris Babbitt's introduced us to, which is a little bit narrow in terms of the sort of copyright doctrine, but I think is a really good one to start to think about. It's only one minor point that he mentioned, is that there's this sort of time-shifting aspect of merger. Maybe some of the things are developed as aspirational things of what the electrical code should be like, but it's not until later that they're actually adopted, incorporated, and then there with the force of law that we have to then think about, well, what is it that we have? Is this really protected? Is it not protected? Right? And then um, after lunch, so we had a wonderful lunch. We were outside after lunch. Um, Sarah talked to us about the important thing of like, all of this is not just an abstract academic exercise. A lot of us are academics, we're here at a law school. It's like people actually need to use this in service of good, in service of journalism, in service of transparency, in service of other things. And she um, gave us this idea is there's, there's really no shame in having a good search engine, right? So Pacer kind of sucks in terms of the access. There's no shame in aspiring to do better with that, <laughs> inspiring to have hooks into things that may be programmatic way to access things in other um, areas um, such as that. Dan walked us through an amazing um, explanation, an example of what he's doing in the state of Colorado. And of course, we know that no uh, presentation is good without a pin and a Big Mac, right? Um, <laughs> but you know, this isn't Georgia, right? And it's also not Kansas. What this is is this represents the roadmap that Dan's talked about that he's going to be making available to people. This is to talk about what is the RFP, what is the operational process of actual revisors' offices, actual court systems, and things like that that need to adopt us so that once it's done and we all start giving him input and using it, this will not be unintelligible stuff. This will actually be the map of every jurisdiction here in the U.S. that we're trying to talk about. Kim talked to us about all of the scanning work that they're doing in the um, Case Law Access Project. And of course, the wonderful, responsible thing that they're doing is taking those volumes, shrink wrapping them, and packaging them away in a place that we know they're still verified. We can go back to them and everything else like that. And I snuck a peek into this, and I know exactly what it looks like where all of this stuff is getting stuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is here. Um, and then. Um, Ed was talking to us about um, some of the challenges in working with um, uh, statute um, providers and states and, and benefits and everything like that. And I decided to distill his idea down into just, he has wonderful presentation of things, and I decided I'm going to put words in his mouth and, and come up with this new idea that TOS yeah. is a POS. Um, so you can um, copyright that. I actually don't even copyright it. It's free to use. Anything you want. Yeah. Um, so there we go. Um, and um, the next thing that we heard about here is, um, in our final panel here, and I just sort of threw these together um, as we're going into it here, is the thing to remember is what today's conference is about is law, but if we're building all of these systems and making all of these decisions and, and creating all of these things, there's lots of non-law stuff out there, and there's lots of non-law stuff that matters. It's the ancillary. It's not just law 
in a vacuum, it's law plus, law and, law with other purposes and other ideas in mind. So those are the things that we really have to think about, we have to execute on, and we have to make connections about what is it actually doing, what purpose is it serving, and what other materials do people need. And rounding things out, um, echoing um, both what Emily had talked about and some of the things that um, Seamus has done, and, is, and why we're all here together today is all we really want to do is we really want to do the right thing, which is finding a way to get together to create, produce, um, enable, connect, and um, distill and promote and distribute all of these ideas, systems, tools, success stories, and everything else like that. So that's really what we're trying to do. But the next thing that we need to do, and this is what I'm standing between you all, Ev, and our, our next opportunity for the conversation piece of this here, is cocktails. So um, what I'd like to do now is close this. If there's any questions or housekeeping things that anybody wants to say, uh, let me know, let any of us know. The destination that we're all going to is conveniently located between here and the airport, if people are going to the airport, or the connection, I think it's where, kind of near where the blue line and the green line come together and some other Close stuff like that. Close yeah. I'm making shit up here. Um, uh, so we're headed to Carry Nation Cocktail Club, upscale, New England, dot, dot, dot. I think Speak that's easy. cocktail, speakeasy. Uh, and that is a picture of all of the liquors that they have uh, available and probably more. It's 11 Beacon Street, Boston. It's by the Park Street T Station. And our target is to get there around 5.30, so give you a little bit of time to you know, clean things up, wrap up if you want to. Otherwise, you can get there early and save us a seat. Thank you very much for everything. If there's any other housekeeping things, um, let us know. Ron, no, thank you for... I think people know that Park Street is right on the green line. So yeah. You get on the green line and go And if you'd like to, yeah, inbound. And if you'd like to go to the library, you know, some of you, it's a library, but you're welcome. Um, my, my staff is on notice that if people want to look around, they can look around. But please um, remember that uh, we're in our study period right now, our exam study period. So. You go into the, the reading room, please be prepared. Thank you very much.